Good morning, everyone. Um, so I would like to thank the conference organizers at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and the Journal of Economics and Business, in particular Paul Kalem, Jalapa Jachiani, Bill Lang, and Ken Kopecki for inviting me to participate in the conference on regulating consumer credit. It is a particular pleasure for me to be back in my old haunt, having grown up at the Philadelphia Fed and seeing the many people I count not only as my friends, but also as my teachers, because I've learned so much from you over the years. I also want to acknowledge my long association with the Journal of Economics and Business and the opportunity Ken Kopecki gave me to serve as an associate editor of the journal and as an editor of a special issue associated with the Federal Reserve System's March 2007 conference on financing community development. Now, it may not surprise you that many of the topics contained in that special issue are still being researched today, including subprime mortgages, foreclosures, predatory lending practices, and consumer literacy. Indeed, some of these very topics are included in today's uh, conference. So I don't think this should be taken as a signaling of a lack of progress. Instead, I view it as recognition that consumer credit is, uh, and consumer credit markets are a vital part of the modern economy, that the issues pertaining to these markets, including regulation, are intricate ones, and that the data and models being used to study these important markets are becoming more sophisticated and informative. Conferences like this one help us to identify what we know and what we don't know, a necessary step on the road to more effective regulation and policymaking. Today, I'm going to offer my perspectives on the research agenda on consumer credit and household finance. And as always, the views I'll present are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. Since I'm in Philadelphia, I can't help but begin by quoting one of Philadelphia's favorite sons, Ben Franklin. Ben wasn't stingy with advice. And among the many pieces of wisdom provided in his Poor Richard's Almanac was the warning he that goes a-borrowing goes a-sorrowing. Yet U.S. households appear to have ignored this warning. Since the 1960s, household debt, including mortgages and consumer credit and other liabilities, has accounted for about 25 to 30 percent of total credit market debt outstanding. Consumer loans, excluding mortgages, have been varied between 10 and 20 percent of commercial bank credit. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, it's easy to forget the important benefits that access to such credit can mean for households and the economy at large. Well-functioning credit markets provide an efficient mechanism for allocating risk and moving funds from savers to borrowers. Credit allows households to consume and invest in goods and services that are currently unaffordable, which, but which are affordable based on their future income, and to manage the risks associated with loss of income. This access to credit allows households to participate in the modern economy. Mortgages allow people to purchase homes, a goal of many families. Auto loans give buyers the means to search for jobs and get to work. Student loans allow people to fund their educations, raising their level of human capital and the productivity of the workforce. So credit allows people to increase their own well-being and contribute to the country's economic growth. Over time, financial innovations, regulatory changes, and technological advances have all led to increased access to credit by households, some of whom found it difficult to borrow in earlier times. For example, the development of the secondary mortgage market and securitization brought new sources of funds to the market. Permitting banks to branch nation nationwide lowered non-interest expenses and loan losses. And the development of credit scoring models lowered transactions costs and allowed lenders to better access and monitor the riskiness of potential borrowers. However, as the financial crisis underscored, not all financial innovations and credit extensions are beneficial to households or to the broader economy, especially when the risks they entail aren't fully appreciated. While household debt to income ratios had been trending up since the 1960s, the rate of increase rose dramatically in the period leading up to the financial crisis from about 100% in 2000 to over 130% in 2007. Over the same period, residential mortgage debt outstanding more than doubled, from $4.8 trillion to over $10.6 trillion. And the consumer debt excluding mortgages rose by nearly a trillion dollars, from $1.7 trillion to $2.6 trillion. <laughs> Expansion of the supply of mortgages, including subprime mortgages, played a role in fueling the run-up in home prices, 
which then permitted an increase in borrowing against home equity, fueling for a further rise in debt. Research by Meehan and Sufi suggests that most of the rise in household debt prior to the Great Recession was due to an expansion of mortgage debt to new home buyers who traditionally had trouble getting mortgages and to an increase in home equity borrowing by existing homeowners. Demanyuk, who's on the Cleveland Fed staff, and Van Hemert found that as subprime mortgage growth expanded significantly before the crisis, the quality of those, loans mortgage, of those mortgages deteriorated. The increase in complexity and opacity of some mortgages and other consumer debt products, including complicated structured debt instruments derived from those credits, also contributed to the problems to come. Adjustable rate mortgages with introductory teaser rates, option arms, piggyback second mortgages, and other types of complex mortgages were offered. Some of these could be sustained only if it were assumed that house prices would keep rising, allowing the borrower to, re to refinance to repay the mortgage. Credit card contracts began including more complex terms like double cycle billing in which interest was based on the current and prior month's balance. As these dynamics continued, systemic risks were building up. The seminal model of Kiyotaki and Moore shows how such risks can be amplified and propagated. In their model, because borrowers cannot be forced to repay, all lending is collateralized. When the economy is performing well, the value of the collateral increases, which supports further borrowing and higher output. But when a negative shot hits the economy and output declines, collateral values also fall, which, which means borrowing falls, which depresses output even further. Thus, the collateral constraint is a mechanism that amplifies and propagates the effects of temporary shocks on the economy. Brunermeyer and Sanikoff build on the Kiyotaki and Moore model. In their model, an economic boom increases bank capital levels high enough so that credit is amply available to borrowers. This lowers the volatility of both output and asset prices. The lower volatility induces banks to increase their leverage and lend even more, so much so that the system is now vulnerable to a negative shock. Gina Kopoulos talks about this in terms of a leverage cycle. Variation in leverage can have an important impact on asset prices and contribute to economic booms and busts. Agents that value the asset more are willing to pay more and leverage up to get it, driving the price up. If they're unable to borrow or are hit with a wealth shock, they'll buy less and the value of the asset will fall. So leverage is high in booms and low in bad economic times. And in the boom times, the economy becomes quite vulnerable to economic shocks. When home prices began to fall, many borrowers found the amount owed on their mortgages was higher than the value of their property. Negative equity led to foreclosures when borrowers were unable to keep up their mortgage payments. Some houses were sold at fire sale prices, leading to further declines in real estate prices. The poor underwriting of many of these mortgages and the concentration of these risky assets into securities helped propagate the problems throughout the financial system with spillovers to other asset-backed securities markets. Other significant weaknesses in the financial system were also revealed. Among these were over-reliance on short-term wholesale funding to finance longer-term assets, which made institutions vulnerable to runs, misaligned incentives, lax underwriting standards, and inadequate risk monitoring by institutions and regulators alike. As the housing market collapsed, highly leveraged households began to cut back on their spending. Businesses cut activity and hiring. Banks, under stress from their mortgage loans and securitized assets, began to restrict credit. Loan losses rose, and bank capital levels shrunk. The economy entered a severe recession. But nearly six years ago, the economy began to emerge from that Great Recession, although seemingly begrudgingly at first. Among the so-called headwinds that held back growth earlier in the recovery, was the significant deleveraging that households needed to do to get their balance sheets back in order. The good news is that this headwind has waned. There's been a significant improvement in household balance sheets over the expansion, and this is supporting consumer spending. At the aggregate level, household net worth fell by more than $10 trillion in 2008. It took more than three years to rebuild that swell, but now, thanks to higher equity in house prices, household net worth has risen to $83 trillion, and is 24% higher than its previous peak of $67 trillion in 2007. Household debt peaked in the third quarter of 2008 at $14.6 trillion. By the third quarter of 2012, it had fallen by a trillion dollars to a trough of $13.6 trillion 
led by declines in mortgage debt that reflect a combination of charge-offs and a drop in new mortgage issuance. But household debt is now rising again as charge-offs have been shrinking and mortgage issuance has turned positive and consumer credit excluding mortgages has been rising. Despite this rise in credit, households' leverage ratios are down. Household debt relative to disposable personal income has fallen to around 100% and is near its longer run trend. The improvement in households' balance sheets is one of the important fundamentals underlying the outlook for continued expansion, further improvement in labor markets, and inflation gradually moving back to the Federal Reserve's 2% target over the medium term. The Federal Reserve System has long supported research on consumer credit and household finance. But the significant toll that the financial crisis and Great Recession has taken on the economy underscores the need for improving our knowledge of the important linkages between the health of the consumer financial sector and the health of the broader macroeconomy and financial markets. Because retail credit is, is an important part of bank portfolios, Fed bank supervisors and examiners need to be able to identify the emerging risks and trends in consumer credit markets in order to promote the safety and soundness of individual institutions. Even though some aspects of consumer protection rule writing and the responsibility for oversight of large banks consumer credit related activities has shifted from the Fed to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Fed maintains responsibility for conducting consumer compliance examinations, including fair lending reviews and financial institutions performance under the Community Reinvestment Act. The act induces lenders to find ways to extend credit and provide financial services in low and moderate income uh, neighborhoods. The Dodd-Frank Act, signed into law in 2010, directed the Federal Reserve and other financial regulatory agencies to augment the microprudential supervision of individual institutions with a macroprudential approach designed to address systemic risk. If anyone ever doubted that emerging problems in household finance pro financial products have the potential to threaten not only the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions, but also overall financial stability, the recent financial crisis quash that view. Retail credit, including residential mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, and other consumer loans, is an important component of the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, CCAR, and Dodd-Frank Supervisory Stress Tests applied to bank holding companies with over $50 billion in assets. And as we've been discussing, because disruption in household finance can have significant effects on the macro economy. Federal Reserve policymakers need to be able to quantify those effects in order to promote our monetary policy goals of maximum employment and price stability. Research in consumer credit plays an important role in helping the Fed meet its responsibilities for mo setting monetary policy, promoting financial stability, and ensuring the safety and soundness of, of the financial institutions we examine. Good policymaking and regulation are not based merely, on good, based merely on good intentions. The basis of effective policy is the economic and finance research that informs it. This research is hard work. Simple intuition that makes some things sound obviously true at first blush may be misleading, in particular when important interactions takes place among its decision makers with different preferences and incentives. Simple empirical regularities may exist in the data until they don't. They don't serve as a reliable basis for effective regulation. Careful analysis can help ameliorate unintended consequences of regulations. Regulation Q is an example of a regulation that started with good intentions and played out poorly. Competition for bank deposits was thought to have contributed to the bank failures in the early part of the Great Depression. The Banking Acts of 1933 and 35 sought to limit that competition by prohibiting the payment of interest on demand deposits and imposing interest rate ceilings on time and savings accounts. Reg Q implemented those provisions. Although the rate ceilings were intended to make the banking system more stable, they did just the opposite when market rates rose sharply in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and there were large outflows of deposits from depository institutions. Of course, to do the sound research needed to inform sound policymaking, researchers need the right tools. In his presidential address to the American Finance Association in January 2006, Harvard University professor John Campbell pointed out that two challenges to the study of household finance are measurement and modeling. 
Because data on households' choice of financial instruments, accounts, and payment methods are hard to obtain, it's hard to gain a deeper understanding of the drivers of those choices and how they change over the life cycle. Standard textbook models typically rely on the representative agent and single period decision making. But households are more complicated. They differ in their rate of time preference and risk tolerance. And for any particular household, these are likely to change over its life cycle. Even my use of the word household is an abstraction, since who actually makes financial decisions within a household differs across households, products, and time. Progress is being made on both the data and modeling fronts. The workhorse data sets of consumer finance research, the Federal Reserve's Triennial Survey of Consumer Finances and Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, are now being augmented by credit bureau data, new consumer surveys, data generated by field experiments, and non-US surveys. Indeed, several papers included in this conference use new data sets. The Federal Reserve System has been putting consumer credit data in the hands of its bank examiners and researchers via the system's risk assessment, data analysis, and research data warehouse, or RADAR, which began as a collaboration between the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. The focus of macroeconomists on better understanding the micro foundations of their models has also helped the study of consumer credit markets. Better computational resources and numerical techniques have allowed researchers to incorporate heterogeneous agents and expanded credit markets with borrowers, funders, and savers of different types into general equilibrium models. These general equilibrium models, which are then calibrated to characteristics of the economy being investigated, allow researchers to study equilibrium dynamics something that simpler models are less able to do. These models also allow for the serious evaluation of different policies, so-called policy experiments. They're less subject to the Lucas critique because by incorporating agents' expectations about the policy regime they're in, the models help uncover structural relationships in the economy that are invariant to the alternative policy choices being studied. On the empirical side, researchers are applying insightful identification strategies to help isolate causal relationships in the data and test alternative hypotheses. Some are running controlled experiments. For example, to uncover the important role leverage played in the effect of changes in house prices on consumer spending, me and Sufi ex exploited cross-sectional variation in household leverage across US counties. An example of a controlled experiment is the study of the effectiveness of home ownership counseling conducted by the Philadelphia Fed's Community Development Studies and Education Department under lead investigator Marty Smith. The experimental design involved random assignments of study participants into a treatment group whose participants received one-on-one -on -one credit counseling as well as a two-hour home buyer's workshop, and a control group whose participants received only the two-hour workshop. The participants' financial performance was then tracked for four years. The study found that both groups benefited from the counseling they received, but the improvement in terms of credit scores, indebtedness, and days delinquent on debt payment tended to be higher for the treatment group. Partly due to the applications of new data and modeling techniques, our understanding of consumer credit markets has advanced quite a bit from where it was 10 years ago. But there's more work to be done. Let me finish with three broad areas I think deserve further study. First, we need to consider what the findings derived from applying behavioral finance to the study of household finance imply for the regulation of consumer credit markets and products. The research shows that consumers often make decisions that differ from those that would come from a standard optimization framework. For example, they often use simple rules of thumb to make decisions or take steps to limit their choice sets before making decisions. Households tend to be under-diversified in their asset holdings and to under-participate in the stock market. They rebalance their portfolios at frequencies lower than those suggested by theory, and many households fail to exercise the option to refinance their mortgage, even though they stand to benefit. The discrepancy between what households do and what theory suggests they should do differs by type of product and by household characteristics. Whether remedies are needed to address these discrepancies or what remedies would be effective in doing so is an open question. Perhaps it's the theory that needs adjusting rather than the behavior of consumers. If certain high-cost loan products are being chosen by a particular household, one needs to ask whether these are the best products available to them. 
are there certain characteristics of the product, product on which they place high value, even if the median consumer would not? Are they being screened out of alternative lower cost products because of their risk characteristics? Or are they being screened out unfairly based on irrelevant information? Are they locked into the high cost product because of high switching costs, which afford the lender market power? Or are they unaware of alter attractive alternatives either because of the complexity of their products make them difficult to compare or be because of insufficient disclosures? Whether regulatory intervention is called for, and if it is, the type of intervention needed would differ in each of these cases. It's also interesting to consider the relationship between the behavioral results suggesting that households may not be fully optimizing because they lack knowledge and financial literacy, and other findings suggesting that some households make strategic financial choices. For example, Amronin, Huang, Xiong, and Zong study complex mortgages with features like zero or negative amortization, short interest rate reset periods, and low introductory teaser rate, uh, teaser, teaser interest rates. Contrary to what simple intuition might suggest, they find that over the 2003 to 2009 period, complex mortgages were used by financially sophisticated borrowers with high incomes and credit scores, and that these borrowers were more likely to strategically default on their mortgages when they were in a negative equity position compared to households with more traditional mortgages. If so, then additional disclosures of contract terms would not have necessarily changed demand for these mortgages or improved the welfare of these borrowers. Guizo, Sapienza, and Zingales also provide evidence of strategic defaults. They find that during the recent housing bust, roughly a quarter to a third of mortgage defaults were by homeowners in negative equity positions who defaulted even though they had the ability to pay. These results suggest that the heterogeneity across borrowers including their level of sophistication, will be important to incorporate into our models and to consider when formulating regulations. A second important issue that deserves more study is how regulation of consumer financial products and markets may affect financial innovation. It'd be a mistake to infer from the financial crisis that financial innovation is always harmful. Innovation has led to a more efficient financial system, extended the benefits of financial services to underserved communities and households, and yielded more product choice. But it would also be a mistake not to recognize that some innovations may be harmful or don't provide su uh, sufficient benefits to justify their costs. For example, loan pricing terms can be so complex as to reduce transparency and impede competition. Some provisions defy easy disclosure, like the double cycle billing, which a bank calculated interest based on the current balance and on the previous month's balance. The Board of Governors banned this practice after determining its complexity reduced transparency and provided no benefit to the consumer. As Campbell discusses, many investment products involve a cross-subsidy from unsophisticated consumers of the product who don't take full advantage of the product's embedded options to sophisticated borrowers who do. But this means that lenders have no incentive to try to educate consumers of these products, since this would reduce the ability to cross-subsidize. Indeed, they may have the incentive to create more complex, hard to explain, higher price products. How to strike the proper balance between regulations that foster a more efficient, competitive, and safe financial system without stifling beneficial innovation should be informed by further research. Finally, given the importance of the household sector to both the macro economy and to financial markets, more work needs to be done on the nexus between monetary policy and financial stability policy. This includes determining the most effective way to address emerging risks of financial stability and developing models that can be used to evaluate how policymakers should incorporate financial stability concerns into monetary policymaking. Improving our ability to monitor and assess risks in the financial system is critically important. But it isn't enough. We also need to be able to evaluate the costs and benefits of actions policymakers can take to mitigate emerging risks before they result in financial imbalances that threaten financial stability. Supervisors are developing macro credential tools, such as counter cyclical capital buffers, capital conservation bu buffers, and stress test scenarios, as well as tools not yet established in the US but used in other countries, including loan to value ratio limits and debt to income ratio limits that vary over the cycle, and which have been targeted to particular sectors like housing credit or household credit. These tools show promise, but as yet their performance is largely untested. In remarks at an economic development con 
conference, former Fed chairman Alan Greenspan cited some emerging risks the Federal Reserve was following in consumer credit markets. He said, quote, last quarter, credit card delinquencies ratcheted up to just short of an all-time high. The consumer bankruptcies continue at a record pace. We also have heard firsthand at the Federal Reserve about the use of equity stripping by some mortgage lenders who have made loans to lower income households that have no reasonable prospects of repayment." End quote. It might surprise you to know that this statement was not made at the height of the recent financial crisis. It was made in a speech given in October 1997, suggesting that although identifying emerging risks may be difficult, determining whether actions should be taken and what actions are appropriate in addressing those risks may be even more difficult. I'd like to end my, uh, my remarks the same way I started, with another quote from our friend Ben Franklin, who said, being ignorant is not so much a shame as being unwilling to learn. The financial crisis and ensuing Great Recession imposed very high costs on the American public, showing there's still a lot to learn, but also that the returns to further knowledge are likely to be very high as well. The research agenda in the area of household finance undertaken by both central bank and academic economists has expanded our knowledge. It's producing results that are informing how we assess risk in individual financial institutions, the overall financial sector, and the macro economy. I hope and expect that researchers will continue to work on the household finance research agenda. This agenda includes the basic theoretical and empirical research needed to produce testable models so we can better understand the complex interactions in credit markets, assess the effects of proposed regulations, and understand the trade-offs and linkages between monetary policy and financial stability. The agenda also includes more applied research focused on tools to better monitoring emerging risks in the financial system and individual institutions that originate in consumer credit markets. We should heed the words of Ben Franklin. As policymakers charged with responsibility for monetary policy and micro and macro prudential supervision, it's our duty not only to support the advancement of this knowledge, but also to be willing to learn from it. Thank you. I think, I think now we have time for questions, if I'm not mistaken, if there are any. Formerly with the IMF. Um, that institution is jumping up and down about macroprudential. And I wonder how it gets implemented in the United States. As I understand it, the macroprudential agency is a body of joint supervisors or heads of agencies underseen by the Treasury. How does that translate down to supervisors at the OCC, the Federal Reserve, et cetera? Okay, so, and there's people in this room who are actually involved in that translation, so they can, they can also provide answers to this. So some of the tools that I talked about in the speech, right, are being implemented as part of the requirements for um, the individual institutions. So for example, right, the Dodd-Frank stress testing, the CCAR exercises, the, you know, Basel III capital regulations and such, right? So those are, those are actually being implemented as we speak on the institutions um, that we examine. And, and of course, it's a joint agency um, examine. I think the deeper question may be is how do you decide between this nexus between monetary policy concerns and macro prudential financial stability issues? And there, I think you're right. I mean, there, I think there's got to be more work to actually understand sort of what those linkages are. At FOMC meetings, we routinely have briefings on financial stability issues. So it's being integrated into the monetary policy view of the landscape of where we're acting, you know, how we're acting and how we're setting monetary policy. But I do believe that more work has to be done on exactly those issues that you're bringing up. Any other questions? Uh, Jessica Russell, CFPB. I'm curious, what are the um, emerging trends that, that you, are, you see as most concerning or most sort of 
worth additional study, and, and perhaps because we don't have good data um, on some of the markets? Well, I mean, the people in these rooms are studying some of the issues, and some of the papers are actually looking at some of those issues, right? I mean, I guess my, my uh, overriding thing is, do we have a way of taking the, what we see going on in financial markets and understanding the trends, and then sort of thinking about them in terms of emerging risks, right? Because I think the lesson from the financial crisis was we probably did see some of it, and yet we didn't feel the urgency to act on it. We didn't fully appreciate what we were seeing. And I think that's where we need to have more work, is how do we take, you know, we see trends in the data, how do we take that? So for example, we know that some of the mortgage markets are coming back and subprime mortgages are being extended. That's probably a good thing in the sense that that market froze. Well, how far is too far, right? I think that's where we need to be doing, focusing our work. Can we, can we make a determination of sort of where that nexus is? And I know the bank supervisors, Bill Lang's groups, and, you know, which, which is doing great work on retail credit risk, they're working on those kind of issues as we speak to try to improve our knowledge of that. So. Loretta, you mentioned the uh, Philadelphia Fed's multi-year study of home ownership counseling. Do you have any advice on additional work we could do to either better understand uh, the positive, po potential positive effects, or to better understand the dynamic in that space to better educate or to identify mm -hmm. educational tools mm -hmm. to both uh, empower counseling services mm -hmm and trickle down to potential yeah. first-time so, uh, homeowners. Yeah, so that study was very significant in the fact that I believe it's the first really controlled experiment, right? And it was hard It was hard to set up because it's very hard to go to a credit counseling service and say, we want you to randomly assign people and not give them, you know, full-blown cr credit counseling. But at that point in time, they had excess demand. There were so many people who needed it, they were turning people away. And that was the trick to signing people up, because signing up the credit counselors to be willing to do this is because they were going to turn them away anyway. We might as well actually get some hard information on whether these things really work. So that was significant for that. I mean, I think, and I, if I'm not mistaken in talking to Marty, I think he tells me that there's a plethora of data they have now, and they're going to continue to analyze the data to try to do exactly what you're saying, which is can we look at sort of some of the results we get and see you know, if things correlate with them. Um, and there's ongoing work in the system on financial literacy, right? Because it's becoming much more apparent that you can't just assume things are going to work. I mean, for some of the reasons I said in the speech, but, you know, there's some things that are more productive than others. You have limited resources. You really have to prioritize and figure out what's working and what isn't. And I know there's ongoing, the Cleveland Fed is doing work on, in this space, and a number of other reserve banks are trying to do exactly that so that we can use the, you know, knowledge that we gain from, gain from experiments and from other um, studies to sort of put people on the right path of what works and what doesn't work. Or else, oh, it's frozen. I'll, I'll give you one more question. To follow up on um, Blake's question, how do we decide on the balance between education and sort of regulations prohibiting uh, banks and other financial actors from doing things in terms of fixing these behavioral biases we see in people? Well, I think, as I said, I think that's an open question. I don't think that we know how to do it, and I think it's going to differ, right? So, I mean, it's the, the ends are easy, right? If, if there's no market failure, right, and no one's being harmed, no problem, right, if there is. But like yesterday's paper, right, on, on sort of uh, payday lending, right? If there's certain attributes of that, right, that are actually valued by the consumers that are getting those, right, then you have to ask the question, well, okay, maybe that's okay as long as they're not rolling it over, for example, right? So I think each, you have to bring sort of a, a, an objective viewpoint to sort of understanding, of, well, don't come in thinking it's evil. Come in being open-minded and seeing, right, what is it about this product that's being, you know, attractive, and is there, you know, harm in that or not harm in that? I don't think there's one simple answer, and I, I think it depends on researchers like you to tell us, right, as regulators and policymakers, you know, what's the pros and cons of those things? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for listening, and uh, it's, it's, it was fun. So, thank you. Thank you.